Hi there, my name is John O'Nolan. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Ghost. So today Ghost is a 22 person startup. We make an open source publishing platform that's written in Node.js, very popular these days, used by OpenAI, Apple, Stanford Review, Harvard International Review, and all sorts of the most popular startup blogs in the world, um, including Buffer and Tinder and uh, many more that you've probably seen or bumped into along the way. We host anywhere from two to three of the top stories on, on Hacker News every day are powered by Ghost. The strange part and the part we get the most questions about is how we got here, given that we only have four product engineers up until this point. Um, we have been distributed since long before face masks were cool, so our team has never been able to share an office or work together in that capacity. And the company is structured as a not-for-profit foundation, so we give away all of our intellectual property as open source, and the business is structured in such a way that I don't own it, Hannah doesn't own it, it can never be bought or sold. It will always be an independent entity that is furthering the future of journalism, the future of independent publishing. Um, but it wasn't always like this. We came from very humble beginnings and the theme of today's talk is going to be scaling very far with very little. Uh, so how we've managed to do a lot with uh, minimal team, minimal resources, completely self-funded, completely bootstrapped. And so there's three kind of points we're gonna touch on throughout this. Uh, the first is the idea that focus allows you to ship faster and better code can come later and shipped code can make you money whilst you're figuring out what better code should look like, and being really careful about which advice you listen to as you start building a product and scaling it uh, can be incredibly helpful to figuring out what the best path for you is ultimately going to be. And to kind of touch on some of those points, I'm gonna do that through the vector of three stories of uh, where those particular inflection points really showed over the years for us. And I'm gonna tell you those three stories um, over the history of Ghost and, and kind of you'll see where we go from there. So the first one is, is really just right from the very beginning of um, of Ghost in its history and, and when it got started. So I wrote a blog post originally, which was the idea for Ghost. Um, I'd been a contributor to WordPress prior to this. And I put together an idea of, uh, or sorry, a blog post of the idea of what I thought WordPress might look like if you reinvented it with modern open source technology and really focused in on uh, just publishing, not website building, not kind of a broad subset of um, flexible features, but really just the publishing workflow. And that did very well got hit the front page of Hacker News, then later we turned it into a Kickstarter campaign. And in the Kickstarter campaign, um, we promised a number of things, or we kind of hypothesized what the platform would look like and talked about a number of features. And there was a lot of features uh, that were there originally, but there were three that really stood out in people's minds. We had this idea of an editor, which supported Markdown and a split screen view. Um, we had this kind of email style way of managing uh, content. And then finally, we had this idea of a dashboard and the dashboard would show you the analytics for your publication and um, you know how much traffic you got, how many Twitter followers, all that kind of stuff. And these three features really stuck out in people's minds because they were the three that were mocked up that had UI mockups that went along with it. But as the Kickstarter campaign came to a close and we sat down and uh, started examining what we could realistically build within the time frame that we promised, which was about six months from the end of the Kickstarter campaign to the first release, we realized that uh, we couldn't build all of them. Uh, it was only me and Hannah. We had a small group of open source contributors to help, but by and large, it was just me and Hannah building everything. Me doing the design in the front end, Hannah doing the heavy lifting on the back end. And we figured out that a uh, Publishing platform absolutely needs a way to manage content and write posts. It can't live without those two things, but conceivably you can create a publishing platform without an analytics dashboard. And indeed the analytics dashboard, um, even today, I'm not sure how we would have built it. In the video of the demo that we did in Kickstarter, it was a faked uh, mock-up. So it was just a series of divs with CSS transitions on page load. And uh, I did a screencast of just pressing refresh and they all loaded in. Half of them were screenshots, the other half were just um, very minimal HTML and CSS. So it was it was hacked together as a concept and we figured out uh, there just wasn't gonna be a way to realistically build it. Something that would have to talk to five or six different APIs, ingest data, store it properly, be able to scale to who knows how many uh, events and depending on what site it was, it was a technical challenge that was going to be insurmountable. So we made the very unpopular decision not to do it. We figured that we could hit the goal of shipping uh, the platform that we'd promise with content management with an editor, but without an analytics dashboard. And when we launched overall, the 
um, feedback that we got was very good and very positive, but there was a small but very vocal faction of people who criticized us heavily for having promised a dashboard but not delivered it. But what it really came down to was the choice between delivering um, a product at all or trying to deliver something that was technically unachievable. But we chose to ship and shipping was the right decision because it allowed us to get the product out into the world. It allowed us to get real users and it allowed us to launch the business, which was a managed hosting service um, off the ground, which would start earning us revenue and fund the future development of Ghost, which was the, the whole plan from the get go from the very beginning. Um, now, today, we're starting to have use cases for where a dashboard might be useful again. We have memberships, we have subscriptions, we have people making recurring revenue from their ghost publications. And we're getting to a point where a dashboard seems both, both useful and like there's a way to do it um, that is actually feasible. Uh, but it's taken seven and a half years to get to that point. And along the way, we've managed to build a sustainable business that would actually be able to build a dashboard. But making that really difficult cut in the very first version of Ghost and destroying what was one of the most iconic features of the idea of Ghost in people's minds was a really difficult one at the time, but in hindsight proved to be exactly the right decision. The next thing that we got the most criticism for after launch, and there was not a shortage of it, is how we structured the code base. Now, truth be told, in 2013, uh, Hannah was mainly a PHP developer who had just gotten pretty deep into JavaScript in the last couple of years, but not necessarily Node.js. And Node.js was pretty young. Like There was not a lot going on in the Node.js ecosystem in late 2012, early 2013. There was barely an RSS module. so. We really uh, had kind of an uphill battle to, to figure out how we were going to build this project, given that there were so few established um, architectures, processes, best practices that we could follow, certainly not for other consumer products. You know, there was a bunch of modules. Node.js at the time was micro modules. Things like LeftPad were about the best example of how you should structure uh, microservices using Node.js. And building something that was sort of equivalent to WordPress was the comparison that we had at the time was just not something that really existed in any way within that ecosystem. So we did a lot of making up as we went along. And even today, Ghost's architecture um, is, as, um, is built as a monolith. So we have all of our different modules um, built into one package, which is downloadable and installable. And the, the kind of core components are we have a REST API at the heart of Ghost, which has an ORM layer. So you can use either SQLite or MySQL, typically MySQL in production, SQLite locally, but you can take SQLite a surprisingly long way. Then we have an admin client, which is built in Ember.js, and we have a front end, uh, which is a handlebars JS templating system that powers our themes. You can plug in storage adapters for file systems, but this entire thing is still today built as a monolith. Now, after seven and a half years, we're just starting to pull that apart now. But when we first launched in 2013, the overwhelming feedback we got was, you're doing it wrong. This is not how JavaScript is done. This is certainly not how Node.js is done. And uh, a lot of the more vocal medium posters of the world uh, were quick to tell us that we were amateurs who would never get anywhere or see any degree of success based on the approaches we were using. And you know what? To some extent, they were right. The approaches we were using were not correct, but the approaches we were using got us as far as we have with as few people as we have now. In 2013, there was no learner. There were no concept of mono repos. And the idea of building everything as a module would have meant managing hundreds, if not thousands of repositories without any tooling to properly do so. And again, with only one CTO and me who could barely work Git in 2013. And let me tell you, I haven't come much further since then. So we had a few open source contributors, one lead developer. What's the fastest way we could make progress? And the answer was to build in the way that we knew how. And the way that we knew how was to structure as a monolith, to figure out where the edges of our application were. And we barely even knew what we were building. We were in the MVP stage of trying to figure out what the product was. And we needed to move pieces around as we kind of figured out the requirements and what bits were working and were not working. And a monorepo, uh, not a monorepo, a monolith fundamentally allows you to do that more quickly because you have less scaffolding going on around the edges. There's less touch points 
paths of where things have to connect. So we went with what we knew and with, despite all the criticism of people saying that it was completely wrong, it allowed us to build faster with less because it was simpler. And that focus on keeping the architecture as simple as the product was is what enabled us to, again, to ship on time, to get the product out into the world, to get it launched and to start getting real customers who told us what the real problems were. We could easily have spent one or two years structuring you know, the perfect code base. And in fact, there were some really um, big pull requests people made telling us how to structure the code base uh, that would have set us back in hindsight multiple years and, and caused us never to have actually been able to ship. This wasn't a particularly um, genius move. There wasn't a lot of foresight. We were working with the reality of what we had in terms of resources and in terms of tools and just trying to get stuff done. If we were starting over again today, I know Hannah has told me we would use Molecular and Learner and uh, you know all the massive subset of tools that are now available that weren't then. But based on what we had available at the time, that was the route we took and it was the correct one. And now in 2020, we're just getting to the point where we really have to break things apart now. Ghost is very large. It's much too big to be a monolith. And we are creaking at the proverbial seams with uh, how difficult it is to kind of find our way around the code base and uh, how many different parts of the code base overlap now with more and more people trying to work in the code base at the same time. So we're now starting to pull apart um, Ghost into separate modules and break apart those logical components so that independent teams can work on them so that they have more cleanly defined edges and APIs to talk to each other, all the kind of standard best practices. But again, seven and a half years we've managed without those things. And it's been an advantage up until this point. Only now is it becoming a disadvantage. And that's such a fundamental uh, difference to what the best practice is that gets promoted most commonly, right? So uh, it's just a slightly different way to think about things that maybe uh, works really well for a small team with, with few resources. At least it did for us. And so the final story that I'll share with you is the one of our infrastructure, uh, which is potentially the most interesting to this particular audience. And it's the one where we've uh, done the weirdest things, which have been maybe the best ideas we've ever had and maybe the worst ideas we've ever had. Not completely sure. The traditional advice around scaling an app when it comes to infrastructure um, usually is try and be economical where you can, but broadly throw money at it and scale things and worry about um, making the economics work later. The final story that I'll share is one around our infrastructure, and it's the one we've done uh, the most weird, interesting things, uh, the, potentially the best ideas we've ever had, uh, potentially the worst ideas we've ever had. I'll leave it up to you to decide what you think. Um, so the traditional way of scaling infrastructure for most startups is to throw people and or money at the problem and worry about the economics later. Once there's product market fits, uh, you know, those problems theoretically solve themselves. We didn't have that luxury. We managed to raise $300,000 on Kickstarter in pre-ordered sales for hosting credit. And we knew that once that money ran out as a nonprofit organization, we could not raise any other money other than by doing more pre-sales, which would obviously not have been possible. So we had to figure out a way to make the economics of what we had work uh, and quickly. And in infrastructure terms, RAM is really expensive. And in Node.js terms, RAM is really needed. So we had this, uh, this difficulty of knowing that we needed to host 20,000 sites or so based on the demands that we were seeing from the Kickstarter. Each one of those sites would be an independent ghost site. So it's a decentralized environment. It's not a centralized um, multi-tenant app. It's individual services for every single site. And each one of those would be an instance of Node and Node has a minimum of 80 megabytes of RAM that it needs to even run. And Ghost on top of that was using you know, a little bit more than that. So we quickly figured out that RAM was going to be the be all and end all of whether or not we could make a managed hosting service work um, at all. And the numbers just did not pan out. No matter which way we ran them, we couldn't figure out any way for us to afford to run Ghost and sell it to uh, people at a price point that they would be willing to pay um, and then make any amount of money uh, that would allow us to keep working and keep going and uh, keep putting money back into the company. It just didn't pan out. Um, nothing about it made sense. So we came up with a bit of a workaround. Um, Ghost is a publishing platform. Publishing platforms create uh, 
static sites usually for the most part. Uh, you publish a post and once you publish the post, well, the site doesn't really change. There's not any dynamic functionality and certainly back then Ghost had absolutely no dynamic functionality of any kind. So we said, well, okay, what if we ran Node.js and we ran the app while people are writing posts and then once they've published the post, we cache everything, um, but forever. Uh, we stick stuff in a cache server with no expiry, and then in the background, we shut down the node app. Okay, so now we go from being able to fit you know, anywhere up to maybe 100 sites on one big app server to being able to fit about 3,000 sites per app server. And for context, the uh, sort of loose architecture of, of how uh, Ghost Pro, which is our hosting service, how that works today is we have an app server pool a database cluster, and then we have these two cache servers, or up until very recently, we had just two cache servers uh, sitting in front of the whole thing. And so what we managed to do is write uh, some Ruby-based startup and shutdown logic, which would just detect which the uh, least recently used ghost site was, and if there were no, if there was not sufficient RAM available to run the current uh, pool of sites, it would just shut down the oldest one, basically. So uh, if anyone tried to log into admin on the fly, we would spin up ghost and their admin would be available. They'd make some edits, publish a post, and then they would, as their activity went away, they would drop to the bottom of the list in terms of priority. So whoever's logging in and writing posts regularly, they're app uh, would basically always be running. But for people who are just publishing you know, once a month or maybe once every two months, which is a lot of people, uh, we wouldn't keep all those node apps running. They would just be perpetually cached. So this is sort of like doing a static site generator completely wrong and backwards in every possible way. But it's in principle, it's the same concept. Now, this architecture has caused no end of problems over the years. And I will be the first to tell you that. Hannah will be the first to tell you that as well. Uh, there have been indefinite number of challenges with uh, trying to get that startup shutdown logic smooth in production, um, trying to figure out the, the URL routing uh, that kind of works differently depending on what state different sites are in. Uh, all manner of problems have come out of that. But the fundamental thing it allowed us to do was to get the product out into the world, get it launched, get it used and have economics that worked. So after 11 months, uh, we hit profitability. Even as a nonprofit organization, our cash flow started going back up again. We got down to about $20,000 in the bank, um, but that was only because we could see the break-even point coming and we'd actually made one or two hires. Uh, we could have, I think, hit break-even in nine months, but we made an extra support hire and it worked out to be 11 months in the end. So we made the economics work first and foremost. and. Um, not without its teething problems, but the platform did work. And over the years, it's gotten better and better. We started on bare metal servers, then we moved to DigitalOcean, things got way better from there. And since then, we've we've upgraded, upgraded individual pieces of our infrastructure to make it more robust, more reliable, and just generally more resilient. Now, of the decisions we made, this was the least controversial, but that was really just because it was the least visible. This is something that, that we figured out internally as kind of, we have to do this, this is the only way to make it work. And uh, it, it wasn't public enough for there to be Hacker News criticism about this as there was about just about everything else, because that's how Hacker News works. Um, what were our other options? Not many, really. Uh, you know, we considered should we do should we build Ghost in a multi-tenant fashion, and that just felt like putting off scaling issues until later. Um, should we do an internal multi-tenant version that we didn't have to do publicly? No, then we'd have to maintain two code bases, which again, we only had one um, one product developer at that point. Um, so it was the best that we could come up with based on the resources and the reality that we had at the time, and it allowed us to get very, very far again with very, very little, which is the theme. And again, it was completely contrary to all advice of, of how to do infrastructure, and probably for good reason. I wouldn't necessarily recommend this approach um, to anyone who is not in the same um, position as us. But the manner in which we got to the decision to choose that as the architecture to use is the salient point that I think is worth taking away, is looking at what are the other options that you can use, given the resources that you have, that will get you as far as you need to go so that shipped code can make you money to sustain your operations to figure out what better code even means. Writing better code and then having no one use it, um, as we all know, is, is fruitless. Um, so putting things that way around and thinking of them from that point of view uh, I think is the, is the real useful point to, to try and take away and see if you can find a way to apply it to what you're doing. 
So those are three stories about how we got very far with very little, and I hope you can find some way to apply them to what you're doing. As of today, Ghost has made over $7 million from customers. We've never taken any other funding, and we're still a nonprofit organization. So all of these decisions allowed us enough time to make money, to sustain what we're doing, to now really figure out what the proper solutions are to each one of those different kind of weird ways of doing things that I mentioned along the way. We started out doing just publishing and blogging. Now we're pushing into the membership and subscription space. And our new kind of tagline is turn your audience into a business. And what we're hoping to do there is bring this same way of building a sustainable business with recurring revenue from the software space to the publishing space. I think we all know the state that journalism is in today, but also there's a lot of independent creators who are starting to do uh, fantastic things independently with, with very minimal resources, just like we did. And so Ghost Now is an independent publishing platform with memberships and subscription revenue built in by default. So if you have ever thought about starting an independent media site or paid newsletter, perhaps, I would encourage you to head over to ghost.org and uh, check it out for yourself. Once again, uh, thanks for bearing with us, despite Hannah not being here, and a uh, big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring us over the years. We certainly would not have gotten as far today without their incredible support and unbelievable platform. And we're so grateful to be able to use DigitalOcean's cloud uh, to run all of Ghost now and in the future. Thanks very much.